so nice to have a family that comes and, and participates in the in the service. Yes. Hi, I'm truly grateful that uh, my children and my entire family participated in the service today. And there is a message in participation that I wanted to uh, give an example of, of being involved. All of us are called to be involved. Mm -hmm. Everyone is called according to your faith and according to the gifts of the Holy Spirit that has been blessed upon you. And so it behooves us to use our spiritual gifts. Um, today's sermon is titled, The Unpardonable, the Unpardonable Sin. And let me say this, usually, and, and throughout history, it has been taught from pulpits that God can only do, uh, or what God cannot do, is two things God cannot do. One thing is God cannot lie. The other thing is God cannot fail. But I'm going to tell you today that there's another thing that the Bible says God cannot do. And that He cannot pardon the unpardonable sin. So the question becomes, what is the unpardonable sin? What is it that God could not forgive? What is it that according to the character of God in the Bible that cannot be forgiven? Does anybody know what the unpardonable sin is? Amen. Rejection of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> now, our scripture for today is found in the book of Matthew. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start from the end and go to the beginning and end up at the end. Don't ask me to repeat that. <laughs> We're going to start and end with the same scripture. Amen. We are in the Bible, in the book of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 31. I will be reading verse 31 and 32. The Bible reads, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Chapter number, verse 32. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So the question is, what is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? What is it that we can do that we can reject God to the point where we cannot be forgiven? Now let me say this. To today, if you are in this church, you have not committed this sin. If you are here, you haven't committed. Because blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is something that is in your character. It is something that you do that you reject God. Amen. That's what it is. But now here's the question. What does that mean? How can I reject God? How do we do it? How do we say no to God? Have an unforgiving nature. Mm. Unforgiveness. When we cannot forgive our brother or our sister. When we cannot let go of sin in our lives. See, the Bible says, when you come to God, when we first accept the Lord Jesus Christ into our heart, what does the Bible say God will do? Take away our sins. The Bible says that He is faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now, if the Bible says He is faithful to forgive us and cleanse us, then what is it that we can do that we can reject the cleansedness? What can we do? See, this is something that's almost confusing in the church. Because for years, I was taught something contrary to what the Scripture says. I was taught that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is when you curse God. It's when you say, I don't want the Holy Spirit into my life. That's what I thought it was. For years, that's what I thought it was. But that's not what blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is. How do we know that? Because what did Peter do three times that Jesus told him he would do? He denied. 
So denying Christ is not the unpardonable sin. What about some heinous sin? What about, what is the worst sin a person can commit? Murder. Murder. Not only murder, what about mass murder? What if a person kills 20, 30, 100, 200 people? Is that the unpardonable sin? No. No, it's not. No, it is not. Because the Bible says God can forgive us of anything we ask Him to forgive us for. But what is it that He cannot forgive? See, the Bible is clear that if we ask, He is faithful to forgive us. But what about sin we did not confess? What about sin that we're still harboring in our lives? What about that sin? See, one thing that God gave all of us is a free will. That means that we have the will to believe God or we have the will not to believe. God will honor whichever one you choose. One is to life and one is to death. But it is your choice. And he will honor whichever one you choose. So when Jesus Christ comes into our heart, he brings what? Who is the comfort? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes inside of us. And what is the purpose of the Holy Spirit to enter inside of us? The Holy Spirit cleanses us. Anything that you are doing or even that you think that is against God, the Holy Spirit convicts us of. Is that right? So when the Holy Spirit convicts us of something and we will not give it up, then we are prepared to commit the unpardonable sin. Now let me say that again. When we have sin in our lives that we will not confess, that we will not put on the blood of the Lamb, that we will not get rid of, then you are preparing to commit the unpardonable sin. Because that means that you are rejecting God. Amen. Because believe it or not, every sin that we've committed, everything you've ever done was nailed to the cross. Amen. If you believe. But if we take our sin, like for instance the sin of our brother or our sister, which is what I'm going to point to first. If our brother and our sister has committed sin against us, and we will not forgive our brother and our sister, then how? what happens to that sin? It becomes charged to you. Some people don't believe that, or don't understand that. But when someone commits a sin against you, and you will not forgive them, then that sin is charged to you. Because you are harboring unforgiveness in your heart. In fact, the Bible says when you bring your gift to the altar, if you have ought against your brother, leave your gift at the altar and go reconcile yourself to your brother or your sister. And then bring your gift to the altar. Because a lot of times we are at the altar with unclean hands. We are at the altar where we have not cleansed ourselves. We have not forgiven our brother and our sister. The reason that this is so important is because here in the church, do we have people on this side that have a problem with somebody on that side? Now we're going to say, well, we don't have that problem in this church. I've been in churches where you do. People are sitting next to somebody they have a problem with. And what's worse than having a problem with somebody is when this problem has been going on for years. And no one solves it. We carry an unforgiveness over something that happened years ago. I'll use an example. Brother Gray stepped on my feet three years ago. And he didn't bother to say excuse me. He didn't bother to ask for forgiveness. He just kept on walking. And this is something that's been hard in my heart for three years. I have a problem with Brother Ray right now. In fact, when we have the meetings, I don't even look at him. Because I have a problem with him. Man, I'm sorry. I didn't even see it. Had you said it three years ago, we're going to say this. But this is just an example. Do we do that in the church? Do we have harbored feelings about our brothers or our sisters that we won't forgive? Imagine being jealous of someone's spiritual gift. I've been in a church where somebody is upset because someone can sing and they can't sing. Because someone can preach and they can't preach. Because someone can teach the word of God and they can't teach the word of God. And they're jealous. And what does jealousy become? It becomes hatred. Because of unforgiveness. Because when you don't forgive your brother, when you can't put his sin on the cross, then you are 
are accepting that sin and you're carrying it around. So unforgiveness can set you up to commit the unpardonable sin. Because you're rejecting God. You're rejecting what he did on the cross. You're rejecting the very reason he came here in the first place. Because why did he say he came? To forgive us. To forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So because of unforgiveness, you are preparing to commit the unpardonable sin. Here's another one. And, and I don't want anybody to be beat up. I'm just saying what the word of God says. What is 2 Timothy 2.15? Can somebody turn to it quickly for me? 2 Timothy 2.15. Every time I preach, I mention it. 2 Timothy 2.15. What is it? Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So the Bible is saying we should be studying. The Bible says to study to show thyself approved unto God. If you are not studying the word of God, you are setting yourself up to commit the unpardonable sin. Because we are commanded to study his word. If you are rejecting the word of God in your study, then you are rejecting God. <coughs> and you are setting yourself up to commit the unpardonable sin. To reject God to the point where the Bible says that you can reject God so much that it will become immune in your heart. Your heart will become so hardened that you won't hear the word of God. That you can't divide the word of truth. It's hard to imagine, but it's true. You can be so consumed with either guilt, with sin, that you won't hear the voice of God. And the Bible says in a lot of days that he will send deception that you will believe a lie because you rejected the truth. So who should be studying the word of God? Everybody. We have a Bible study in this church. Who comes to Bible study? If you're not here for Bible study, where are you studying the word of God? I'm not here to beat anybody up for not coming to Bible study. But if I see 60 people in this room, I should see 60 people in Bible study. Because we're commanded to study His Word. And if you reject the Word of God, you're rejecting God. Here's another thing. I don't want anybody to raise a hand. Who paid tithes and offerings today? Do we pay tithes and offerings? Are we commanded in God's Word to pay our tithes and offerings? Amen. Do you come to church without your tithes and offerings? If you do, you're rejecting God. Because the Bible says, will a man rob God? Yet he had robbed me. But how, you say, have he robbed you? In tithes and offerings. That's in Malachi. Bring me all the tithes to the storehouse. So that they can eat in my house. And prove me now he will. See, the Bible says that God will prove that paying tithes reaps rewards. If you don't believe that, you're rejecting God. See, the myth that goes on in the church is that the, the, uh, the unpardonable sin is something you commit before you die or before he comes. But you set yourself up to commit the unpardonable sin whenever you reject the word of God, no matter what it is. Do we really love our brothers and our sisters as ourselves? <clears throat> See, the Bible says there are two great commandments. Most of the time in church, we only talk about the first one. To love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. But what about the second one? What about the person sitting across from you? What about your brother or your sister? Do you love your brother or your sister? Because if you don't, if you reject your brother and your sister, the Bible says you don't love God if you don't love your brother. See, what I want to do today is I want to clear up something. I want everybody to understand that the whole purpose of the gospel is love. Amen. The entire purpose of it. The purpose for Jesus Christ to have came to this world in the first place is because he loved us. Amen. That same love we should have one to the other. There shouldn't be any jealousy. There shouldn't be any envy. In fact, let's go back to jealousy. Do you not realize that when a person has a spiritual gift in the church, who is it for the benefit of? The church. It's for the benefit of the whole church. 
So how can I be jealous of someone's spiritual gift when everybody's benefiting from it? But we have that in some churches. We're so thankful we don't have it in this room. We're so thankful that every person in this room loves everybody in the room. That we don't have anybody that has a grudge against another. I apologize for my grudge against Greg for stepping on my feet three years ago. I have forgiven him. But if I didn't forget it, did I forgive it? No. What does the Bible say God will do with our sins? The Bible says he's faithful. That he will forgive our sins. In fact, the Bible says that he will throw our sins in the deepest part of the ocean and will not remember them anymore. Amen. He will not remember them. He would go as far as the east is from the west. I don't know how far that is, but it's pretty far. <laughs> and you don't want God to bring up your sin. In fact, the Bible says that just as you forgive, the same measure will be given unto you. Amen. How are you want your sins to be forgiven? Do you want God to bring up what you did three years ago, four years ago, 20 years ago for some of us, 50 years ago for some of us? Bring up all your sins. Say, wait a minute, you did this, you did that, you did that. You wouldn't want that. Because you know how many sins does it take to not receive salvation? One. It only takes one. And if it only takes one, then is anybody in here guilty or innocent? We're all guilty. Every one of us has done at least one sin. No matter how young you are. So who are we not to forgive our brothers and our sisters? Who are we to look at our brothers and sisters as if they're guilty? And we're not. See, you know what? I stopped what I was preaching about. Because in my heart, I can feel something. I can feel in this church that some of us have problems with each other. Some of us have problems that go way, way back. In fact, you ever heard of a person being so angry with somebody over years that they forget what they was angry about? Oh, yeah. All we remember is that I was angry. I don't remember why. I don't even remember what it was about. I just remember I was angry. Anybody know the story of the Hatfields and the McCoys? No. Does anybody know what that feud was really about originally? Okay. It was about jealousy. One family was jealous of the other family. And for hundreds of years, they feuded with each other until one of the children fell in love with another one. And then all of a sudden, said, so why are we really angry at each other? I don't know. Grandpa said that we're supposed to be angry at those people. <laughs> they don't even know why they was angry. See, this is what forgiveness does. You get rid of the anger. You get rid of the guilt. You get rid of the frustration. Some people think that, well, I'm still cleaning up the mess. So I, I have a problem forgiving if I can't clean up the mess. This person caused a mess in my life. You want me to forgive and I'm still cleaning up the mess? Yes, we do. Because how do we clean up the mess? We have the help of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's called the comfort. Amen. Yes. Forgiveness is not for them. They might not have Forgiveness is for you. That is true. We're Amen. talking about your salvation. We're not talking about theirs. See, some of us have a problem when it's not reciprocated. If I say I'm sorry, but they don't, I gotta still got a problem. I want to carry the guilt. Now it turns into anger. But that's not forgiveness. Because if it's put on the cross, it's already been paid for. It's already been paid for. Won't you like to invite people to the church and into the, uh, the, the Christian, uh, Christian family and their sins have been wiped away? Isn't that the whole point of going to heaven? That there won't be any sin? But this is what the Bible is saying we should do to our brothers and our sisters. If you can't do that, then you are setting yourself up to commit the impartial sin. If we cannot love each other, if we cannot forgive each other, if we cannot serve each other, See, serving somebody is not just simply handing out something for help. Serving someone in the Lord is loving. When you love somebody and you're serving in love, then you care about their needs. Their needs become more important than your needs. We ain't just handing out something. We're loving somebody. This is why we're here in the church. 
Because in the church, we are to strengthen each other. The Bible says we are to strengthen. When we come together, we should come together in strength. That's why it says in the spirit and in truth. We should be stronger when you leave here. Whenever you meet each other and we're not in church, when you pray, you're supposed to leave stronger. Because it increases our faith. And what does our faith do? It makes us strong enough to resist the temptations of Satan. We need spiritual strength. This is one of the reasons we come here. When you pray with each other, we pray for strength. We pray that our faith fail not. That we can resist the temptations. That we can resist what the devil is doing. See, if I ask a question, who in here would not want to ever even think of committing the unpardonable sin? Who would raise their hand? See, everybody's hand would be raised. But when you ask the other question, are you going to Bible study? Are you paying your tithes and offerings? Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind? Do you love your neighbor as yourself? Do you obey all of the commandments of God? See, the picking and choosing commandments is not what this church is about. <laughs> we have to obey all of them. That's the same reason why when I say forgive your brother, you have to forgive him for all of it. You can't forgive him for one thing and hold him hostage over something else. <clears throat> Sometimes it sounds harsh to tell us that we're not about the Father's business. But I can't stand up here and not tell the truth. It's hard to do. It's very hard to stand up here and say something that we know is not true. But I'm appealing to you to love each other. To love the Lord your God first. To study His Word. You know one thing the Word does? According to the Bible, the Word of God is our comfort. The Word of God is something that enlightens us. It helps us to have better understanding of everything that's going on in our lives. It's our strength. It is our joy. If it's all that, why aren't we in the Word of God daily? Look at what you are missing when you're not in the Word of God. See, the peace that passes all understanding is not peace because nothing is going on in my life. It's not peace because everything is hunky dory. It's peace because I know my Father <coughs> liveth in me. It's peace because I know that I will never be alone. It's peace because I understand where my help comes from. See, to say he's my creator, my redeemer, and our sustainer. That's the peace that passes all understanding. This is the peace that Paul and Silas had while they were in prison. This is the peace that Daniel had when he was in the lion's den. How can you be in the midst of lions and have some peace? We need peace. Sometimes when we're dealing with our brothers and our sisters, it's hard to have peace with chaos going on in your house. It's hard to have peace when your brothers and sisters are telling you something that ain't true. It's hard to have peace in your heart and in your mind when somebody is persecuting you. <coughs> but the Bible says clearly, all those who live righteously will suffer what? Persecution. Persecution. But while you're suffering persecution, you're supposed to remember what the Bible says in Psalms 121. Does anybody know what Psalms 121 is? If I lift up my eyes in the hills from which comes my help, my help comes from where? Lord. My help comes from the Lord. The Lord which made heaven and earth. We have to know where our help comes from. We have to know when we come together, we come together as one. We come together as prayer, in prayer as one. See, there's strength in numbers. We need to start praying with each other. We need to start praying for each other. When we're at home and we're going about our daily lives, put some prayer in there. Put some Bible study in your life. Put some praises to God in your life. How often do you say hallelujah while you're at work? 
How often do you praise God just because you made it to work? See, it's, it's easy to praise God in the sanctuary, but then raise in hell when you're outside. That's not what the gospel is about. Take it with you. You know what I did? I, 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 somebody, in, in, I don't want to say the name, but she's sitting back there. They, they put the Bible on my telephone. And I always wanted to, do, to be able to, to read the Bible, you know, because I can't carry my Bible at work. But I have my phone, and the Bible is in my phone. And it's, I, I, I had to learn how to work it. My, my little girl taught me how to work it. But it, 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 it's so nice. But I, I take it with me. And, and so what I'm saying is take the Bible, take the Word of God with you. You know, take it with you. They make these things in smaller forms or in cards or somewhere. Find a way to take Scripture to work with you. Take Scripture to school with you. Bring it with you. So that when you need help, we don't have to wonder what, what's going to happen. We don't have to sit and, and, and wonder about, the, the Bible says that we have no fear. See, because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Of wisdom. Take it with you. Now, before I close, I want to do something. I, sometimes I've done this in the past, and whenever I get reports, it's always been positive. Because when you're up here and, you, and I look at you all and I feel that some people need prayer, you know, if you need prayer, if you need to leave here a little stronger, if you need to surrender any sin, you don't have to name the sin, if you're willing to come to the altar at the close of service today, I want anyone who needs prayer to come to the altar. If you've got an aching back, if you're wondering whether or not you are truly free from sin,